Hello YouTube and hello uh, people in Crewe if you're at the gallery space. I'm just making this little video about this gallery exhibition I've got in Crewe which starts on Monday. Today is Saturday. Uh, I just want to just think through some ideas about the relationship between the two not exactly versions but the two places where this video and some of the other videos around here will be at because what I'm doing is to the best size I can you know I'm trying to clone the spaces really so I'm trying to I'll be redesigning my YouTube channel a wee bit you know just putting different backgrounds and banners and stuff on there and changing the playlists a bit to as best I can simulate or at least echo the real space of this little gallery space in crew so uh, I'm doing these two things simultaneously so I can't help but think through what the distinctions are and they're some of the more interesting things I think about all this stuff that fall out of the differences uh, I mean the most obvious one that springs to mind is that you know anybody can put a video on YouTube but not everybody gets the opportunity to put some videos or art material into an art gallery you know, and I'm quite fortunate in that regard. I used to, it's a gallery that's attached to a university I used to work at, so I've got friends there. Uh, and the person who runs the gallery, hello, hello Jane, uh, she knows me and she knows that I can talk about this stuff. Uh, you know, and seems to find it interesting enough to make it worthwhile uh, putting on public display, which is nice. But, um, yeah, and, and, and knows the kinds of uh, histories and, and to some extent shares those histories that uh, leads to this kind of expression so uh, you know all that makes kind of sense uh, but as I say not everybody can do that I mean not, not everybody would want to do that and accept that fully and I'm certainly not recommending it there's no money in it I'm not being paid or anything like that for it it's uh, it's just something I find interesting so um, so yeah so that really that's the most obvious thing uh, but there's some things come out of that as well, isn't there? You know what I mean? Because, you know, how do things end up in... I mean, obviously there's a really simple explanation I've just given you for how this stuff ends up in a gallery. And if you're in the gallery, that's how it's, that's why I'm there. <laughs> and if you're on YouTube, that's why I'm not where you are, but there. Uh, but in a broader sense, you know, about how things become art or not. I mean, there's been a few videos on YouTube about art recently. And it came up at this place I was at in Paris last week, I think I've mentioned, you know, the Making Sense conference, about the relationships between different kinds of access to uh, the, art, the art world, in inverted commas, and art markets and technologies and this kind of thing, and the, how the differences in those access and the difference in kinds of education one might be interested in having relates to this thing called art, you know, and the fact that it becomes a thing in our minds, you know what I mean? That we can categorise and identify and define in some ways, albeit with a bit of problems around the sides of that. So I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking about how that's changing, because I think it is changing, and uh, Web 2.0 technologies like YouTube are really at the forefront of that change, I think, and it's going to be a change for the better. Although it'll be a bit weird for a while. <laughs> and there'll be some bastards around who don't want it to change. Anyhow, yeah, um, the frame I'm thinking about, so sorry if this is going to be a bit theory, but I won't make it hard. Um, the thing, the frame I'm thinking about is what um, this guy called Chick Set Me High, uh, Mihai Chick Set Me High calls the dynamic systems or the evolving systems model, and this is just a, it's a model of creativity he's got, but it maps really well onto I think how art markets work and how the art world works and how things to be come to be uh, defined as art according to the workings of a system because most definitions of art you know if you ask what people it it, it it tends to be about feelings or it tends to be about the emotions or the intentions of the artist those kinds of things and they're perfectly valid uh, but you need to, i think you need to augment that with other more uh, kind of social and political reasons why things are allowed to become art and other things perhaps aren't even though they're superficially quite similar. And I think Chick Set Me High's model does that. And what he basically says is, you know, it's a three-part system. You've got the artist, you've got what he, and then you've got what he calls the, the field, which is a, a bunch of people and institutions who's, who have an investment in the kinds of products that exist in the art world. And then he has what you call the domain. And the domain is the kind of history and the contemporary memory of, of what's happening in that field at the moment. Uh, he gives a number of examples, some of which are from science, some of which are from 
sports and some of which are from the arts. The science ones are the easiest to understand really. He says basically what happens is that when you're learning something in the sciences, there you are as a, an individual, not an artist but an individual let's say, and the, uh, the people who occupy the field, the experts, introduce you to the domain. So if you're a biology student, you go to college, which is an, an institution, a field institution, staffed by members of the field, people who are experts in biology, and those experts in biology will introduce you to the domain of biology. They will tell you about what biology is, they will introduce you to the methods, the, the state of current knowledge, and you as a student will begin to embody those things. And eventually, you know, if you do your homework and you play your cards right, you might even be able to, you know, go through undergraduate and postgraduate training and produce a PhD at the end of it. It's got original research in it. Original research, you know, you might find something new out. And you'll have found that when you find that something new out, you will present that knowledge to the field, the field of experts. So you'll take it to the institutions, you'll take it to the peer-reviewed journals, you'll take it to the conferences, you'll take it to the experts who know what the field already, what the domain already contains. And they will look at this thing you've written, or this experiment you've carried out, and they will compare it to what's already in the domain. So, oh yeah, this piece of, this finding, it makes sense, and it adds to what this person said, and it draws on this previous knowledge. And if it passes muster in that regard, then they publish it, or they, it goes to the conference or whatever. And after that, it becomes part of the domain that the next round of individuals are exposed to. Yeah? So it's that whole standing on the shores of giants thing that Newton talked about. You know, you find out what's already there, you embody it, and that elevates your knowledge to a point where you can add the next stone to the cairn of knowledge, passing through the gatekeepers of that knowledge who, as I say, have an investment in the knowledge of the domain themselves. <sighs> I hope that makes some kind of sense. It took ages to say. Anyhow, that's, that's, that's the classic model how it works in science, but it also works in every other field, really, uh, according to Csikszentmihalyi High, anyway. You know, that the way our society works, it has these institutions, uh, which in the arts would be things like art schools, art journals, galleries, performance venues, programmers, critics, you know, that whole, yeah, that whole raft, educators, that whole raft of people who understand the domain, they, are, they know about art, they know the history of art, they know the contemporary discussions that's going on in it, they know, uh, you know, who said what about what, they know its critiques, you know, they know what's going on really. Uh, and as you, as an art student, let's say, you learn about that from these people, you learn about it from the experts, you learn about the histories of arts, you learn about the contemporary discussions that's going on in the arts. And once you've got that, once you've been elevated on the shoulders of those perhaps giants or not, then you yourself again might add your cairn of, of, uh, of art knowledge to the pile. You know, you might produce a piece of work which makes sense in the context of that previous history or in, those dis in the context of those discussions. Uh, and then that's put forward to the to the field. You know, you show it to your tutor at college, or you submit it to an art journal, or you make application to. Um, come on, pups, let's go this way. You know, you make application to have an exhibition at the gallery or something like that. And the person you're in communication with will compare what you've submitted to the rest of the domain and says, "This does this genuinely add to the sum total of human arts knowledge?" And if it does, then you're in, basically. Now, there's all sorts of problems with that, you know, it is open to all kinds of abuse and there's lots of discussions about what constitutes valid ad valid additions and there's all sorts of problems to do with how you gain access to that kind of knowledge in the first place, you know, it costs a lot of money to be a student, perhaps. Um, and it's, it is, and once you put the, the whole kind of financial system on top of that, the art market, then it becomes rife with corruption and, uh, and other kinds of uh, impetus comes through, you know what I mean? I mean, you can just imagine what state the sciences would be in if people were collectors of scientific knowledge, you know what I mean? And, uh, and certain rich individuals got to decide what certain what knowledge made it through or not. I mean, that's basically how the art market works right now. So, yeah, so it is, it is rife with uh, problems. But that's kind of how it works. Uh, and that's how, in a way, that's how my piece gets into the gallery, really. That's why my videos are in the gallery and not you on YouTube, whoever you are. Uh, that's why Mel's basket case videos aren't in the gallery. That's why Gary's and Mendham's videos aren't. That's why Skeptical Atheists and Girly Voices videos aren't in there. That's why I Am Myth Purr's videos aren't in there. 
uh, whatever, you know, you can list got Laura Lea, that's why your videos aren't in there. Because of that, the weird, both interpersonal and um, interrelational practice that goes on in this stuff. Anywho, YouTube's different though, isn't it? Because uh, there is no gatekeepers of culture on YouTube. There are no gatekeepers. There is no harsh distinction. There is no domain. You know, unless you create one artificially, like this um, Guggenheim thing. There is no artificial domain of of authenticated uh, YouTube video work, which is the which constitutes like the you know the uh, the canon of YouTube videos that we all aspire to add our little stone to. Doesn't happen. There isn't there. Nor is there a field of experts. It's all a bit anarchic in, in good and bad ways. Uh, it's all a bit funny, really. Not my dog, it's all right. Somebody else. Somebody else with dog barking. Yeah. So I want to blend that in this little exhibition I've got. I want to kind of blend that. So I'll, so I'll have, as I say, some other people's videos, if that's all right. <laughs> Uh, coming in from the outside alongside my authorised ones to the extent they are authorised. This video will be there as well of course. It's all terribly self-referential.